After the Super Bowl, it kind of just feels like you need to have Patrick Mahomes or you just like don't get to win the Super Bowl. So is there a Patrick Mahomes in this draft? Let's talk about Caleb Williams. It's Locked On Vikings podcast. You liked it on three, one, two, three. You, liked it! you are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast, where we're always trying to learn something new. It's part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And thank you so much for making Locked On Vikings your first listen of the day, each and every day. My hashtag everydayers, I love you all so very much. I appreciate you all so very much. You can find the show wherever you find your favorite podcasts, whether it is an audio listening place like Sirius XM. You can find live broadcasts of all hometown hometown broadcasts of all Minnesota sports and other sports games there if you just search them out on the Sirius XM app. You can also find the show on YouTube or Amazon Fire and Roku. Just download the Locked On Minnesota Sports app on those smart TVs. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest, most and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to pricepicks.com slash LockedOnNFL and use code LockedOnNFL, all lowercase, for a first deposit match up to $100. So, I, I haven't really talked about the playoffs or anything because the Vikings aren't in them, uh, but they're over now and the Chiefs won. Congrats to the Chiefs again, I guess. <laughs> and it's funny, when you, when you have like a back-to-back Super Bowl win, which I haven't seen since I was 12, which is the 0304 run for, for Brady. Um, boy, it just feels like kind of pointless to be anyone but the Chiefs, doesn't it? <laughs> Obviously, that's not real. I mean, nobody's ever three-peated, right? So if the Chiefs do win the Super Bowl again, it'll be the first time that's ever happened. It's not like this is something that we can just like ch- pencil in as a foregone conclusion until Patrick Mahomes retires, right? But it does kind of raise the question of like, if you don't have Patrick Mahomes, what are you supposed to do? Because they ripped through a lot of people with a lot of different strategies that aren't have Patrick Mahomes. They ripped through uh, a team like the Dolphins that was built through, you know, like a bunch of draft pick hauling and and a true tank. Uh, They ripped through the Dolphins. They ripped through the Ravens, who kind of bought, bought into a very unique quarterback in Lamar Jackson and, you know, took their guy and really built everything they could to tailor what they, they do to him specifically. I really like hyper specialized. That was great. I mean, the second MVP for him for Lamar Jackson, right? Uh, then they ripped through the bills who kind of did the opposite of what the dolphins did, where they just like built this very like patient, uh, and methodical team over years and years and years. Uh, and really fell in love with a quarterback in Josh Allen and, did whatever they had to do to get him when that happened. That's all these different ways to get a quarterback and they all lost because none of them are Patrick Mahomes. Um, so that kind of leads me to think about, well, is there ever going to be a, a way to get another Patrick Mahomes? Will there ever be one? Who it is? Who is it? Right. And we should probably talk about Caleb Williams then who gets that comp all the time. And I super see why, but I don't know if I like feel it in the same way. I'll get to it. But he's way like overwhelmingly favored to be the first overall pick. Right. And and it's kind of a matter of whether or not that's the Bears or if the Bears trade down and let that be somebody else. Right. That's the choice that's facing Chicago right now, which I'm sure Lauren Cox talks about a ton on Locked on Bears. So if you're interested in their mindset, go listen to him. Now, it's it's like pretty insanely unlikely that Minnesota is the team that ends up getting Caleb Williams. But. I'm using the word unlikely very purposefully there. Unlikely is not impossible, right? Um, I mean, shoot, if you want to look at look at it from like a betting odds angle, uh, Ben Johnson was like minus 2000 to be the commander's head coach at a certain point. He pulled out, right? It was a surprise. Nobody saw it coming, but surprises happen. Uh, The I mean, look at Brock Purdy being the guy in the Super Bowl, you know, in his second year. That's a surprise. Nobody really had that one. It happens. Um Always and never just shouldn't really be in your vocabulary, especially when it comes to the draft, which is the like notoriously hardest thing to predict. The draft is a crapshoot. I say it all the time. It's a cliche. It's a cliche for a reason. So I think for me to look at Caleb Williams and see, you know, all right, 
I, he's just not worth my time, right? It's like probably a mistake. And it's, it's honestly, it's a mistake I made last year. I didn't really pay any attention to Bryce Young. And I kind of wish I had, you know, if only just to be better at covering the NFL for Locked On NFL, which I also do. Uh, check it out on Tuesdays. But also just to kind of cover my bases because you just never freaking know when a gas mask is going to pop on and somebody who is supposed to be the first overall pick is going to fall. Um, I, that's... I, I have a tier when I do my like horizontal big board called get the gas mask, which is specifically for people that I think will go high enough to be out of reach of the Vikings. And the only way we have any prayer at them is if something weird happens on draft night. Right. Um, that was like CJ Stroud last year or whatever. Right. But even going into the draft last year, there were all these, all these rumors that maybe Houston didn't like him as much as we thought that they should, because they had some drama with his agent and it turns out they got over that and they're better off for it. But it's still, I think, worth it. I, I, I like. I'm just trying to preempt. I know a lot of people are going to respond to this by saying, like, why bother talking about Caleb Williams? We're not going to get him. He's going to be a bear. And sure, that's the m- most probable outcome. But probable isn't certain, like definitionally. So I think it's still worth our time to at least know what's out there. And honestly, if he's going to end up in the division, we should probably have an idea, anyways. Um. So. What I want to do today is talk about Caleb Williams from the perspective of the Mahomes comparisons, what I think Mahomes has that he doesn't. Maybe he'll get it someday, but he doesn't right now. Uh, And in the hypothetical world where you have to trade up for him, what do you do? Do you do that? Would you, should you pull the trigger on that? Uh, I think it was Ian Rappaport had a report this week, like from the Super Bowl, like media week that it would take like a historic haul. And of course, right? Uh and, you know, that probably means you're you're blowing out the Trey Lance trade, right? Uh if you wanted to do that and Caleb Williams turned into Patrick Mahomes, like he just is Patrick Mahomes now and now every year the Super Bowl or the the conference championship weekend has like Mahomes and whoever was good that year and you with Caleb Williams and whoever was good that year, you are not going to miss those first round picks, right? Like you got it. You're good to go. You you got the guy, right? So it's probably pretty worth it to do that, assuming he t- turns into Patrick Mahomes. But again, that sounds a little bit like certainty and we don't do that on drafts season. We, we do not do certainty. We do. I like guys. I don't maybe don't like guys, but these opinions will always be very weakly held. The second somebody shows something that goes the other way, I'm going to come off it. Like I do not need to, to stick to my draft priors at all on anybody really ever. So we can try to play the odds game and go through all of the different like probabilistic like factors about, you know, height and arm strength and all the measurables we'll see at the combine and production things. And we could we could go through that. I'm sure you're going to be able to find that elsewhere. And I unlocked on Vikings. I like to give you something you can't find elsewhere, which I think. A little bit more nitty gritty is going to be better for you to understand Caleb Williams and whatever you take with that package is yours. This is how I'm doing all these quarterbacks. Um, However you take that package and however you decide you like it is your business. That's you. And you may just valid, whatever. But let me at least tell you what you're getting into beyond what we know about Caleb Williams, which is that he's this like scramble ramble dude that loves to run around and make all these cool plays and throw across his body all the time. And it makes him look like Mahomes all the time, which again, like coming off the Super Bowl and Mahomes lifting that Lombardi for the third time going, Hey, maybe I want a guy that looks like that guy. Right. Of course. Uh, here's the deal. I'm not as high on Caleb Williams as everybody else is, but that's a relative thing, right? That doesn't mean that I don't think he's an undraftable player or anything like that. Uh, I don't think he's my favorite quarterback in this uh in this class but you know what that's ra- that's ranking quarterbacks and we don't do that here that's not that's principally I'm against that I'm religiously against that so I'm not going to do it I'm not going to rank him but we'll talk about him all right so we'll we'll go into what makes him look like Mahomes in a minute Today's episode of Locked On Vikings is brought to you by Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app with over 3 million members. It's a pretty easy game. It's just you against the house, you against the numbers. You pick two to six of your favorite players. Uh, Now that football season is is over, you can still do this with like NBA, hockey, baseball when it comes around, all of that. Um, College basketball, of course. And you pick more than or less than on their prize picks projection. Anything from uh, assists, rebounds, general points, fantasy basketball stuff as well. 
All of that is available and you can even combine some of your favorite athletes, find fun specials, all of that. Really fun stuff. You can also do their, they've still got their demon and goblin thing going on with red demons that are a little bit spicier. But if you hit the more than on them, you get a better payout. And then the goblins are the opposite. They're not quite as spicy, but you don't get quite the same payout if you want to do something more conservative. So go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL and use code locked on NFL for first deposit match up to $100. That's prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL code locked on NFL for a first deposit match up to $100. Thanks again for making Lockdown Vikings your first listen of the day. If you want to see all this stuff on video, go to patreon.com slash NFL. Uh, you can find a video where I go over most of these talking points about Caleb Williams. Uh, you can also find a wide left piece that I wrote about him a while ago, but that's mostly like a tutorial on scramble rules, and there's like a little bit about Caleb Williams. Um, so if you're interested in that, go check that out as well. So the first thing that I noticed with Caleb Williams, obviously it's the first thing everybody notices, right? This is a, like electric mind numbing playmaker stuff that's just going to like totally melt your face off. He gets in trouble. He runs around. He eludes a guy. He runs back around like pressure evasion, or I'm just going to say like guy evasion, tackle forcing missed tackles. Maybe you would call it. Uh, it's just this elite skill. He's just very, very, very good at that. Very agile. It's the kind of athlete that he is. He's not a top line runner. He's not like a, we're going to house this thing from 70 kind of runner. That's not his game. That's like that's like the Lamar Jackson move. Or, or if you want somebody in this class that does that, Jaden Daniels does that. He, but it's more, I mean, he definitely is eyes down. Like he's, he's never really looking to run, run. But he's going to scramble around and make a bunch of really cool plays, right? And to do that, he throws across his body all the time. He throws on the move all the time. I love the way that he throws on the move. Um, I have a game for you. If you're going to look at throwing on the move, by the way, if you want to, um, try to, to predict whether or not a, a throw will be good, you're going to probably see if you're on social media, you're probably going to see a whole bunch of clips of quarterbacks throwing on the move, whether they're clips from a defensive end that got a pressure, whether they're clips of that quarterback himself, you'll probably see a bunch of Caleb Williams clips. Uh, or clips of like that receiver or tight end or whatever doing something, uh, something about the O-line. You're, you're going to see a lot of clips, right? Um, anytime you see somebody throwing on the move, I want you to try to pause before you see where the ball goes, uh, if you can. Um, or if you even are just like watching, like if you're watching like the XFL or UFL, I guess it is now, which I will be, by the way, real ball knowers love it. Um, wait for guys to throw on the run. And if you have the capacity to pause, as soon as you see the throw, but not before you see where the ball goes and if it's accurate or not. And if he's running to the left or his non-dominant side, we'll say, because for a lefty, that's different, right? Um, there's two different ways to approach it. There's um, like, you, you know, you've got hopefully two hands on the ball if you're smart, which by the way, doesn't always, Caleb, uh, get two hands on the ball, dude. <laughs> but if you have two hands on the ball and you're running to, to your non-dominant side, that means to throw it with your dominant hand, you got to turn around, right? You got to turn your shoulders around. This is the way Kirk does it when he's throwing on the move to his left. And it works great. He'll, he'll get his shoulders turned and then he goes. The disadvantage of this is when you should turn your shoulders, the defender gets to know the ball's coming now, right? So he can be more aggressive about his break and on jumping the ball. So it's harder to get those, but you're going to be able to be more accurate and that might work. It's just a little bit slower and clunkier. Uh, and when you're in a scramble drill, reflexes might not matter anyways. Those guys might be trailing, whatever. It works. It works for a lot of quarterbacks. Uh, or you can do it the Dak Prescott way, where he will actually fling his leg out in a way that sort of twists his hips up, and then he can throw, untwisting those hips, and you can get that same kind of torque that you would get from a, a normal base. That is actually a very natural thing for you to do. If you are in your backyard, you're throwing a football, and you try to throw on the move without corking your shoulders... Um, your leg will kind of naturally go out on you. It's just the way your body kind of feels like it wants to be when you're, when you're doing that torque. Um, that is also going to work really well. And, and Dak Prescott throwing on the move is phenomenal, right? Especially up to his non-dominant side, um, to his left. And then if you're looking at a lefty like Michael Penix, you got to flip all this, but you get it, right? The outside leg will like flick out and they'll kind of throw, they'll be like in a starfish while they throw. Um, if you're going to the right side, to your dominant side, you'll see that front leg will do that same swing, but it'll swing over the back leg. So their legs will actually cross as they throw. And it looks super wonky, but basically if you see legs cross like that before they throw, you're going to find an accurate ball like almost all of the time, unless it's like an actual spatial perception issue. 
Um, but if you see that leg cross over, again, it closes your body up. And as you throw, your your body wants to reopen and it's going to reopen itself. Everything's going to get out of the way and you're actually going to be able to do a pretty nice and accurate throw. Um, Caleb, if you watch Caleb Williams do this, you get teach tape. It's fantastic the way that he throws on the move and the way that he can throw inside himself on the move, which uh, AKA throwing across your body, which you're kind of never supposed to do. So that's the, the scramble rules part of it all where you're not, you're not supposed to throw across your body. He does it all the time. He gets away with it. And so that obviously raises the question, okay, NFL DBs are going to be a little bit more on it than like Oregon. So are we still going to get away with this? Or are you going to throw a couple interceptions uh, across your body, lose your confidence? And now suddenly you have to construct a, a style of play that doesn't rely on these scrambles as much. Right. And you're going to have to do things a little bit more normally from in the pocket. Now, my opinion of Caleb Williams in the pocket is that it's fine. It's it'll work in the, I don't think that he's a guy that needs to be out of the pocket to function, but I do think that that's what sets him apart, right? Like that makes him elite. And if you lose that part of his game, what else is like, what's, what sets him apart from everybody else? Right. I think because of this mentality, he always has like the play in his brain. And I'm psychoanalyzing a little bit, which I think is this like necessary evil of quarterback evil. You got to try to figure out what they're thinking, right? Rather than just looking at the physical. Um, and so what I think that he is thinking is that he always has like the ESPN top 10 play in his head. Very USC. Jordan Addison had this too when he was there with him. Um, but he always has this, this idea of, and I love that in a receiver, by the way, not so much in a quarterback, because I think quarterbacks need to be willing to be a little bit more conservative, like a lot of the time. But anyways, the, the reason I say that is if you watch his feet, his feet are not calm. And I'm not going to use the happy feet term because I think that that doesn't have a lot of meaning anymore to people. That's just like that can mean bouncy. That can mean running around a lot. That can mean a, a lot of different things and it doesn't specify it enough. But but what I see is when he's when he's on his base, like every quarterback's pretty good when they just are like drop back rhythm throw. Right. If you got an issue with that game, I've, you have a very, very bad issue. Um, and it's when you have to start progressing. That you can then kind of see a little bit more about how they operate under not pressure, but like modest duress. Just the idea of I have to get to my second read and the clock is ticking. I'm not seeing that there's actual pressure. I'm not, um, you know, nobody's open and I got to make something happen. Like that's none of that stuff. It's just that, okay, the situation now requires some actual mental processing instead of me being able to just execute the rhythm thing that we drill all day and go off. I can't go off muscle memory anymore, right? That's the world. And when we get into that world, you start to see his, his brain, A, he's looking for escape outlets, even in clean pockets when he doesn't need to look for escape outlets, which means eyes drop out of the progression and they can drop back up to the progression once he's out and he's actually really good at that. Um, but his feet also get out from under him. When, you, when you're no longer on your base uh, and you know your feet are no longer nice and in the ground, you know, weight onto the balls of your toes, ready to move around, ready to throw whenever, right? Before you throw, you better get those things back under you or you're just not going to be as consistent. And Caleb Williams is great at throwing on the move and great at throwing off platform, but it certainly is a crutch. And we see this with Purdy a lot, Brock Purdy. I know it's hard. I thought he played fine in that Super Bowl. Um, but in the game against the Vikings, for example, that he lost a lot of those, right, where he just like sailed one because he just didn't get his, his feet set and he could have. Um, I think that that happens a lot with Jordan Love, and I think it happened in a really bad way to them in their playoff loss, too, uh, as well as the, some of the other high profile losses that they had. Uh, those guys, I mean, look, both those guys were in the playoffs, right? So this ain't this ain't a bad thing. But I think for you to tr really, truly be the truth, to be the Patrick Mahomes now, I need to see you be able to to understand when you are and aren't supposed to be in an off-platform chaos circus mode, right? And for me, you should always want to be in a normal mode. But if you are, if you have to go to uh, circus chaos mode, like you're doing that out of necessity, not out of comfort. 
That's not where your comfort zone should be. And it's where his comfort zone is. And he's always looking for that. So his feet will get out from under him and his eyes will get out from under him and, and, and he'll kind of lose some of that. And what this is going to really come down to is time and how much time it takes for you to get from your snap to your drop through your progression and to your next decision, right? Whether it's throw or scramble or whatever it is. How long does that take you? How compressed is that? There are ways to rush that too much. We talked about that with JJ McCarthy, how if you get through that too fast and none of the routes broke off and you didn't get any information, you're just going to kind of check down no matter what's going on downfield. That's not the habit you want to be in. Um, but on the flip side, if you take forever, that means you're going to have to buy time, right? You're going to have to start running around because linemen can only block for so long. Cornerbacks can only cover for so long, especially in the in college. So it kind of is this formula that could work where you could run around all day. Your O-line can't block all day, but that doesn't matter because you're running around and you're evading everybody. And now they can't cover you, right? You can go throw all day long and go go win the Heisman. Um, But that I think allowed him to never really have to speed up his process. And his process is too slow. That's that's the deal with me for Caleb. And that's maybe the biggest difference between him and Mahomes. And the biggest thing that I think is preventing me from looking at him and being like, that's the guy. It's too slow. It's got to get faster. Um, it's all slow. The, the drop back is, I think, a little lackadaisical and a little bit slow. It's got some rhythm to it. It's just a little bit lopy. Um, the progression itself He'll get through a progression. He'll go one, two, three, four. Like he can read the full field. He's not one of these like half field quarterbacks or one of these like pre-snap read kind of quarterbacks. Drake May, I think, is one of those um, that you, you're worried about. Can he pick up an NFL offense? That's not where I'm at. I just want the execution to speed up. I just want it to be a little bit faster. And for him to get that decision made, whatever it is, before the defense has a time to adjust to what's going on. And that's that's what makes somebody that's that's the difference right now. Maybe I should leave Mahomes in the past. To me, that's the big difference between somebody like Caleb Williams and Brock Purdy. Brock Purdy makes that choice quickly. That Purdy is in this was in the Super Bowl because he makes that choice quickly, not because of he he's you know, can run around and, you know, escape the pocket and flip up some stupid check down to Christian McCaffrey or, or anything like that because he could make those, those decisions quickly and, and throw accurate balls, especially over the middle. Um, that just, that makes it so hard to defend, especially when your receivers are, are good after the catch, like Ayuk and Samuel and Christian McCaffrey, when he's a receiver, like that's what made San Francisco work. So if you put Caleb Williams on the San Francisco 49ers right now, I do not think they get better. And, and hey, he's young, right? He's got development to do, and maybe that isn't true sometime down the line. But right now, you got work to do, right? So let me um, keep musing on this and I guess tell you where I'm try, – try to be nuanced about like where I'm at on Caleb Williams because I don't want to go too hard. Today's episode of Lockdown Vikings is brought to you by Door Dash. So I had a Super Bowl party, had a lot of fun. Um, but look, things almost went real bad with the food. <laughs> I won't get into details because I don't have time. But it was touch and go. All right, we made it. But if we didn't, I I, I honestly had my my phone like ready to just be like, I got to Door Dash something because people are like going to be coming over and I almost burned something. So if that's you. And uh, you want a convenient way to just solve a problem, even if it's like you're in the middle of cooking something, you need an ingredient, or shoot, you're just too lazy, you want to get some delivered directly to your door, that's what DoorDash is for. Also, Clutch, DoorDash for flowers, that's a thing that you can take advantage of if that is a need for you. Uh, so, you can get dinner, groceries, flowers, gifts, whatever, on DoorDash, your door to more. Head to the DoorDash app to get everything you need delivered. Wrapping things up here on the Locked on Vikings podcast, I want to speak a little bit more philosophically. Um, Caleb Williams represents to me the allure of the eye candy. And I think a lot of the draft analysis that you will see is very wrapped up in the eye candy. The eye candy is cool. The eye candy is, is a very good play, and it's not just fool's gold. I'm not making the argument here that when you do this runaround thing and you make this really great play, that that's not a valuable skill that can turn a third and nine into a first down, you know, a third and nine that's pressured into a first down. If you want to try to like quantify that production, you would go into, you know, the, the low likelihood of that being converted because it's third and long and, and because that's pressure. And 
you know, the EPA value of turning a third and long into a first down and, you know, the low likelihood of success there. And like what you'll get is that that is something that could get you these like huge, huge chunks of value all at once. It's absolutely a valuable skill. It's only one skill though. It is not the complete picture. Um, and I think with a lot of these, and this is not just a Caleb Williams thing either. This goes to other positions, other players. The flashy, really cool thing, you go, whew, wow, what a great rep. Um, can sort of color your mind or the extreme reps, right? The other way around too. The super bad miss, right? The, um, you know, the really, really rough interception, that kind of thing can really color your mind. And I think with people who aren't in on Caleb Williams, which I mean, he's not as consensus as somebody like Trevor Lawrence was when he was coming out, right? There are definitely people who are like, eh, I think Drake May's better. Like that's a, that's a take that's out there. Uh, nobody was saying that about like Zach Wilson in 2021, right? Um, so this is a different landscape, but like, even for those people, I think it's also the eye candy. It's just a negative eye candy. It's like the Notre Dame game. So if you didn't watch, there's this USC Notre Dame game and Caleb Williams did his runaround thing, but he threw a bunch of really rough interceptions doing that, or, um, against Arizona state. I think it was too. He threw a, a, a kind of the same nasty, hideous one, but it got dropped. So we were all right. Um, and for that, uh, a, a thing that happened to him a couple of times was uh, he would get into his runaround thing. And most defenses, when you start to run around, we have the scramble rules. Again, read the wide left article for more about like what those are. But in short, all the receivers are working toward the quarterback and working to a place where they're helpful to the quarterback, away from the defender toward the quarterback, however that works, right? And defensively, most defenses that we see nowadays are either zone match or man match. You don't see a lot of pure zone anymore. Sometimes you see some cover one guys, but that are like pure man. Um, but when you're in that matchy matchy world, uh, once you buy them, you can't sell them. That's the way that, uh, I think it was Brian McFadden put it when he and Patrick Peterson were talking about it on an episode of his podcast. I was watching when a couple years ago and Peterson was here. Once you buy them, you can't sell them. That's the deal, right? especially in like a zone match world. Once he comes through your zone, he's yours. Now you are just playing man coverage on him. You just, you have him. That's your guy, man, cover him. And if he leaves your zone, you leave your zone too. You're, you got your guy now, right? And if somebody else comes into your zone, somebody else should have him. Um, so that means you get a lot of what functionally turns into man coverage when you're in a scramble drill because scramble drills happen late in the play. Everybody's kind of already declared who they, who they've got, whether it's man match or zone match, you're in, you're in man. Now you're in just cover, cover. Um, and so on that scramble drill, you kind of, I think he has gotten into the habit of identifying each person, right? Or whoever's in front of him, identifying who's covering that guy and then identifying is that guy open, right? That appears to be the thought process. And a couple of the interceptions he's thrown have been to somebody who wasn't covering the guy he was throwing to, was covering somebody else that happened to come back into the play or whatever, for whatever reason, because the spacing can get so warped on these. Um, so that's interesting. It doesn't come up often enough for me though, to be like my main critique of him. I think that's like kind of cool to think about <laughs> in a way, like academically, but when it comes to, does that affect my desire to draft him first overall? If I'm pretending that I'm Ryan Poles, I uh, eh, not really like it's a, it's something you can fix. B it's something that comes up like twice a year. Like it's fine. It's you'll maybe get a couple bad plays. It's just a thing you live with. Uh, and, and it's the cost of all that other scramble stuff and it's very much worth it. Um, so that's not my big thing. My, my big thing is, am I committing? And this is why I think it's so funny that it's the bears because I, it sounds to me like I'm talking about Justin Fields in 2021. Am I committing to a guy that has a lot of cool improvisational ability and am also committing to a really slow offense? This is what has ailed the Bears for two years. And it feels like they're just jumping right back into it, but like with better PR because you don't have all the fields baggage from like three pretty bad years. So I don't know. I, th this is why I get like kind of skeptical about being the team that's like, all right, Bears, we got four first round picks. I'm going to send you a superstar player and like two other starters. We're going to do this, you know, historic call. Let's do this. Um, obviously, like I, I should, it, it I think goes without saying, but I should mention it just so I can say I mentioned it. 
the, the Vikings can't do this. They shouldn't do this to the Bears, right? And the Bears are not going to be the, they're not going to let the Vikings be the team that comes up and gets Caleb Williams so that they have to play him twice a year and it's a whole thing. Like they're, they're not going to do that, right? They're going to, they're probably much more keen to do this with the Raiders or Broncos who uh, aren't even in the conference, right? Than they are to the Vikings. So it's all very much likely a moot point. But again, the gas mask thing could happen, right? What if we get further into draft season and in a month and a half, a whole bunch of people agree with me in buildings, right? What if they all go and see the same thing I see, right? And and suddenly they, they start thinking, I don't know, maybe I'll take this LSU kid instead. Maybe I'll take this UNC kid instead. And suddenly Caleb Williams falls to fourth or fifth. And, you know, the draft to TV is going crazy. This is the, the draft fall of the century, right? It's not like a high highly ranked quarterback has ever fallen in the draft, right? Like, that would be unprecedented, right? We've never seen anything like that before. Surely, surely that nothing will surprise us in, on draft day. Surprises on draft day? No. <laughs> so what if that kind of thing happens and now you're talking about going up to fourth or fifth, you get a little bit more comfortable, right? Um, I do think that he needs a supporting cast. I think he needs an O-line that can hold up for a long time so that he can comfortably learn how to get faster without relying on all of his other uh, other you know, scramble ramble skills and using them as a crutch. You love that scramble thing. But like I said before, it, it shouldn't be your comfort zone. And if you're under pressure all day, because you end up on the Patriots who have a horrible offensive line, um, it's going to become your comfort zone because the pocket isn't comfortable to you because you're under duress all day, which isn't necessarily your fault, but it is your problem. Uh, so th that's where I end up here on this Caleb Williams thing. I, I think he needs the right environment. I do think he needs a year. I, I don't think he comes in. I mean, he, he might start right away and just they're just going to like it, like commit to chaos ball while he learns. But that environment needs to be nurturing. And I think if you just show up on a bad offensive line and 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 try to be all right, ah, man, I think you're in trouble. I really do. Uh how he develops will be crucial. There are absolutely, I can see the path to him not developing at all. And everybody going, oh my God, how the first overall pick bust out so hard like this, right? Same exact conversation we're having with Bryce Young. Oh my God, how did this go so bad, right? I can see that world happening with him. And I can also see the world where I'm made to look like a total idiot. And he is the next Mahomes and whoever drafts him, whether it's the Bears or someone trades up, gets to be the class of the NFC for 10 years and all that. Like I, I can see that happening and I can see what needs to happen to get there. And it's not nothing. It is not a passive process. Development is not a passive process. If you think development is a passive process and you can just throw a quarterback in and just, it'll just happen. He'll get all of his nice development points and I can go unlock a new Madden skill trait. Then I guess you would love uh, Caleb Williams, but that's just not ever the way that I think about it. Um, okay, tomorrow, ask me questions. You can find me at Luke Brown NFL on Twitter. Uh, I'll put out a call there. You can also send an email to LockdownVikingsPodcast at gmail.com or fill out the Google form in the show notes. So we'll get on to all of that. I'll see you all for that. And as always, skull.